One, two, three! Oh, Why, hello there. Brent here with Bring Your Own Tools on today's episode. If you want to see how we made this one-of-a-kind table for a very special reason, keep on watching. Let's get started. So, piano keys. I don't know how to play the piano, but I certainly can make a unique tabletop with these piano keys in mind. And this is a very special project. It's gonna be a unique one because these are very sentimental to a special individual in my life. Her father has passed away and he was an amazing piano player and teacher of the piano. And she wants to do something special with these keys. It's gonna be a surprise. Let's surprise her. Just be careful. There's only one set of these. With a project this special, we have to have a special piece of wood, which is why I picked up a 12 foot long, 13 and a half inch wide piece of black American walnut that we're gonna cut in half, and it's gonna be a perfect complement to our piano keys. So, start cutting. Now, luckily for us, the slab is slightly over 120 inches, so therefore I measured off 60 inches on both sides and then figured out where the center of that point is. Grabbed my large carpenter square and struck a line right down the center using the straight flush edge on the back side because this material is S3S, which means it's surfaced three sides. Just one side is rough. I brace my carpenter square with a couple clamps and then grab my circular saw which uses the carpenter square as a guide for a perfectly straight cut. When gluing up long pieces of lumber like this, I always suggest using some type of biscuit. And I'm gonna be applying a few biscuits down this entire joint to ensure that I have an easy transition when gluing these two pieces together. I spaced the biscuits four inches from the ends as well as around 12 inches for the entire middle section. Just remember, if you are new to biscuit joining, this doesn't provide any structural strength for the actual glue up. It just makes it a lot easier when gluing these two boards together because the biscuit does an amazing job at centering the boards and therefore clamping is a lot easier because the boards are basically forced to align properly due to the biscuits. I apply tight bond two to both sides generously, as you can see. Once you have your glue applied, insert your biscuits on one side, lay the boards down flat, and start clamping them together. Personally, I love pipe clamps because they're so versatile and they're extremely strong, so if you do any type of sizable clamping, I would highly suggest getting a few of these amazing pipe clamps. I will make sure there's a link in the description box below. I let the glue dry overnight and remove all of our clamps. There may be some minor sanding needed on the bottom section, especially if you weren't able to get up all of that glue because it was on the underside of the slab. Hard to get to sometimes, but it is important to have a nice flat bottom for our next step. I spent quite a bit of time thinking about how I was going to commingle this slab with the piano keys, and the best solution I came up with was actually notching a section into the slab, and therefore after I cut the ends off of the piano keys, they would fit nicely and snugly within the slab so it actually looks like the keys are built into the slab itself. Personally, I love how this transition turned out, and there's obviously numerous ways you can actually go about doing this. I have a router sled table, and therefore this is the way I did it, but let me know in the comment section how you would do it if you had to do this. In order to get a nice square edge on both sides, I took a very sharp chisel and chiseled away all the excess in both corners. Then I decided to start sanding. Now, you don't have to sand the whole thing as of yet, but make sure you sand at least the side that you're gonna be pouring the epoxy on because once there's epoxy there, you're never gonna be getting to those edges anytime soon. After your sides are sanded, go ahead and clean off your entire work surface and apply your packing tape. Now this is just your generic standard packing tape, but you need to apply something like this in order for the epoxy not to stick to the surface that you're applying it to. We are obviously making a form for our epoxy pour, and for the ledges themselves, I'm using some tall silicone ledges that are actually for concrete forming, but they are perfect for epoxy because epoxy can't stick to them. 
I pre-drill a few holes and fasten the boards down properly. The most important thing to do at this point though is to apply some silicone on the bottom edge first and then fasten the boards down. You really want to do this step because it will significantly decrease your chances of any leaks down the road, which is always important when working with epoxy because leaks aren't fun. No, I've been there. Not fun. You also want to silicone and tape your edges in order to avoid any leaks on those sections as well. But guess what? That means we're done with our form and we can let it dry and proceed to our piano keys. For this project, as you can see, we have a number of piano keys and I can't use all of this length, so I have to actually cut them all down to size. Each white key I'm cutting down to approximately seven and a half inches, and I cut all the white ones first and then the black ones because I set up a stop block in order to avoid any type of measuring needed other than the very first cut, plus I had to change up the stop block for the black ones because they had to be shorter in length. Once I had all the keys cut, I could proceed to cleaning. And for cleaning, we're just using denatured alcohol because it actually does a great job at removing stains and dirt and grime, as well as it completely dries very quickly so I don't have to worry about any type of residue left on the keys afterwards. But guess what? Now that we have our slab and our keys prepped and ready to go, it's now time for epoxy. And for the first portion of epoxy, we are using Total Boat High Performance Resin that's a 2 to 1 ratio with the fast acting hardener in order to guarantee that this epoxy dries very quickly because we want to set the keys in place with this first and then proceed with our thicker pores. I personally don't like the look of looking through an epoxy slab all the way down to the floor, so I'm actually adding a bit of black pigment to this small batch, which I think personally complements the wood as well as the keys, plus it gives a bit of depth to the overall piece. I maneuver the epoxy evenly in order to distribute and make sure that there's no white showing underneath, and therefore, once we have that taken care of, we can start inserting our keys. Now this is obviously the first time that I'm ever doing this, so there was a bit of a learning curve to see and make sure that the keys would not move around on me after I installed them in place, which did take a bit of time just to even them out properly, but as you can see, after we had them set in place, they look amazing. Oh, and just make sure you have either a torch or a heat gun on hand to pop all those tiny little bubbles. Now that we have our first thinner pour taken care of, it's now time for the main event, the actual thick set epoxy pour. Just note that this stuff can only be poured about a half inch to an inch thick at one time for larger pours. So we are gonna do two separate pours for this one. Let's get started. In the very near future, you will see why it's so important not to over pour your epoxy. But before then, let's go ahead and talk about this epoxy. It's the thick set epoxy, it's a three to one ratio, which means it's actually more runny, and therefore it has a longer drying time, but thicker pores are possible. Before we pour our epoxy, I do add a few accents to this piece that are actually part of the piano. This seemingly was a part of the piano that we wanted to incorporate in some way, and in such a cool, unique shape, I just wanted to put them on the sides of the piano keys and really complement the entire piece in the front. I don't know if I'll ever get the chance of pouring epoxy on piano keys, but just take a moment to appreciate the unique beauty that this is and the unique project that it is, because I know certainly most people are not going to be taking on a project like this, but hopefully you find quite a few helpful tips along the way on this project, and let me know in the comments below on what tip you found most intriguing or vital for your next project. I poured four liters of epoxy on the first pour, then let it dry overnight. The next morning I came back to it, and as you can see, it's quite jelly, but it's not fully hardened, and therefore we are ready to go with our second pour. However, the one thing that I did differently on the second pour compared to the first is the fact that I actually had to use six liters instead of four liters to bring the epoxy up all the way to the top of the wood slab edge. And that, in all honesty, was probably my vital error because it just made it a little too thick and therefore it started overheating. And when epoxy overheats, it's never good. 
But if this does happen to you, just keep in mind, don't panic, and try and cool it down in some way. I turned off the heater, I actually applied a couple fans and hair dryers on the cold setting, and that really reduced the amount of heat that was coming off of it. And as long as you're able to reduce the heat, you're able to calm the epoxy down to the point where it will not start yellowing on you, hopefully. There are definitely a few bubbles that will be encased in epoxy for eternity, but in all honesty, it really gives the piece life, and hopefully by the time you see the end result, you'll agree with my assessment. I start removing all of the side panels of our entire form, as well as trying to get underneath this large slab. Now, when you're working with a slab this size, it is somewhat difficult to try and get underneath it, but a large crowbar does do wonders. Just make sure you're careful with the bottom side of the wood because you still don't want to damage it. Now there's a number of different ways to get this thing fully flattened, but for me personally, the best solution I have on hand is my router sled from Woodpeckers. I know not everyone will have the system because it is an expensive system, so if you are interested in having and creating your own router sled system, I did do a video on how to create a $20 router sled, so if you are interested, check out the link above. But the beauty of this type of system is the fact that you can get things extremely flat very easily and fairly quickly. Just make sure you're wearing a respirator because this does get dusty and messy as you can see, even with a vacuum system hooked up. And like always, if you are interested in any of the tools or products seen in these videos, I will make sure and leave links in the description box below. Once I have the top taken care of and flattened appropriately, I then clean up my mess and proceed with the same exact process on the back side. Keep in mind, I'm taking multiple passes on both sides because I don't wanna overwork my router. I'd say the thickest pass that I took was an eighth of an inch thick, and that was the most at any one time. Once all the planing is taken care of, we can proceed to sanding. And for sanding, I'm using a five inch random orbital sander, and I'm starting from 80 grit and working my way up all the way to 320. Now between those steps, I'm going from 80 to 100 to 150 to 200, and then all the way up to 320 grit, taking my time between each pass in order to guarantee that we're not gonna have any finished swirl marks on the bottom or the top of the slab. I set up a guide and use my circular saw to remove both ends of this slab in order to make sanding a little bit easier. Keep in mind that if this was just a wood slab, I probably wouldn't have gone any higher than 200 grit, but because we had epoxy on this project, I did go all the way up to 320, just to guarantee that we're not gonna have any issues with sore marks in the end. I do sand down all sides with my random orbital sander, but after that, I do come back with a flat piece of sandpaper just to ensure I have as smooth of an edge as possible. I wipe down the entire backside with mineral spirits in order to remove any of the miscellaneous dust and debris that's left on the surface and proceed to finishing. For the back side and only the back side, we are applying furniture finish by walrus oil. For the top, we are gonna be applying a epoxy flood coat, but for the bottom, I just wanted to make sure that there was some type of finish on there in order to protect and preserve the wood for years to come. I let it dry overnight, and the next morning, I come back and wipe off any excess that I find. After all the excess is removed, I then flip over the entire table onto the back side and start working away on the front. The first thing I do is I actually grab my router with a quarter inch roundover bit and proceed to going over all of the top edges to have a really nice crisp feel on the top surface. This really does a beautiful job at making a nice professional look and feel that really doesn't take much skill or time to do. Just be careful. After the routing is complete, I then proceed to sanding and it's the same exact process that I did on the bottom. 80 grit, 100, 150, 200, and 320 grit. I'm not gonna bore you with the copious amount of time that I spent on that, just know that it took hours to do. After the sanding is complete, I go over the entire surface with mineral spirits as well as a tack cloth just to get up any of the loose debris that the mineral spirits left behind. 
But once we have that taken care of, it's now time for finish. And for finish, we are using Total Boat Tabletop Epoxy. This is a one-to-one -one ratio, and the real nice thing about this product is that it leaves an extremely beautiful and smooth finish to any project. I mix the epoxy thoroughly and proceed to applying my finish. But first, before we do our overall flood coat, I always suggest applying the finish to the edges first and then pouring your epoxy. That way, when the epoxy eventually drips down on the sides, it doesn't completely soak up all of the epoxy that it's pouring off and therefore having a smoother finish in the end. I grab a small foam roller to distribute the epoxy evenly across the entire surface, and this product does an amazing job at leveling itself out as it dries. So therefore, if it doesn't look completely fat as you're rolling it off, just give it a little time and it should level itself out very nicely. Oh, and it is always advisable to have a torch on hand to pop all those small bubbles that might not come to the surface naturally. I let the epoxy set up for a couple hours and come back and proceed to removing any of the excess epoxy drips from the bottom edge. Key note on making sure you do this before it fully hardens. Go ahead and wait 24 hours and as you can see, you have one beautiful surface, but the bottom side does need to be sanded down if you want a perfectly smooth finish on the bottom side as well. Easy enough, all I had to do is take 200 grit sandpaper, remove all the excess epoxy, and then apply a secondary coat of furniture finish of walrus oil, let it soak in a bit, then wipe off the excess and install our legs. As for table legs, I picked up these Y table legs from Doug Mocket, which has a really beautiful, unique, and simple look and style, but still has a bit of character because of this wide shaped design. If you like them, I'll make sure and leave a link in the description box below. As for install, I marked my fastener location, pre-drilled my holes, and actually insert threaded inserts for the fasteners themselves. This is a very nice professional look as well as a very strong fastener for securing these legs properly. All you have to do is use a hex head to fasten them in place and then install your fasteners as needed. But of course, with this being such a special piece, we do need to brand it BYOT style. So we put on the final touch and guess what? We are done. This is truly a one-of-a-kind piece, and in all honesty, I really do love how these bubbles came out, and it makes these stationary keys really feel like they're coming to life. But in order to finish this project off, we gotta deliver it. Let's do that. The table is in. Let's do this. Huzzah! Luckily for me, this very special person in my life lives right around the corner, so it was a short two minute drive, and I'll let the surprise reaction speak for itself. One, two, three! As you can see, this is a very special moment and is probably the cutest BYOT fan club I could ever ask for. It's truly a blessing for me to be able to give back to people that I cherish and love in my life. And the fact of the matter is, this table will be around for generations to come and is truly one beautiful, sexy beast. Oh yeah.